Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. We're just waiting for some more people to arrive. Um, what a beautiful afternoon it is. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Chris, Chris Woodfield, and I am going to be the host for today. So really excited to have you with us. Um, more people are arriving as we speak. So we'll just give it a minute or two just for people to settle in, sit comfortably or stand comfortably, whatever's good with you. I don't know where you are, but the sun is shining and really excited for this event and really excited for you to be joining us. So thank you. Um, so this is Climate Action. The time is now. And we've got a few more people arriving. So let's just settle in. And we can make a start. So yeah, good afternoon. As I said, my name is Chris Woodfield and I am the Low Carbon Devon Knowledge Exchange Officer here at the University of Plymouth. And we are really excited to be hosting this event. Um, got some lovely um, speakers lined up to really have a thought provoking conversation around climate action and the time is now. So what we're gonna do is just do a brief intro um, I'll just give a brief intro and a bit of background, and then we can we can dive in. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to acknowledge, um, thank you for coming, and obviously it would be it would be great and really wonderful to be in person with you, and having some conversation over a few drinks or some flapjack or some sustainably sourced sandwiches. But unfortunately, we can't. But hopefully, we will be soon. So. We're here on Zoom, so I just wanted to acknowledge that. And also, whilst I'm just doing the intro, feel free to put in the chat your name and where you are from, um, either location or company you're representing or business you're representing. Feel free to put that in the chat so we, just so we can get an idea of who's here, who's in the room. Um, but we've just muted everyone for now, just so we can make this event really smooth and comfortable uh, for everyone and we're also recording the event just so we can share it afterwards uh, some people have said they can't make it so if you don't want to be recorded one suggestion is just to put your camera off but it would be really lovely if you could keep your cameras on because it just makes for such a richer experience seeing some facial recognition and some smiley faces and some curious curious eyes so if you if you are able to keep your cameras on that that would be awesome um just for yourselves and and, and the speakers um so i just wanted to say hello to our speakers um so we've got four lovely people who are going to be sharing some words with with us this afternoon so i just wanted to quickly say hello to them so we've got um, Phil, Andy, Alice and Natalie. But I just wanted to say hello and just maybe if each speaker could just share briefly who they are, where they are. And one thing that made them smile this week or smile today. So Andy, should we come to you first? Sure, so great to be with you. Thanks for the huge opportunity to do this. I'm based in St. David's on the west coast of Wales. A lot of my time is taken up with working out how to do regional or country scale change. And that's what's that's what's taken most of my time. And what's put an exciting what's put a smile on my face is recognizing the scale of change that's gonna happen if by the time that my grandchildren were born last year reach the age of 15 in 2035 when we talk about these climate targets. And I think when you start talking about climate in real people's lives, it brings home the shift that's gonna happen. Thank you. Awesome, thanks Andy. Um, should we go over to Phil next? Hey everyone, uh, I'm Phil Hoff. I'm from uh, Verpalico, uh, Head of Design. We're based uh, just outside of Totnes on the way to Dartmouth. And um, I think one thing that I mean, one thing that's making me smile every day at the minute is the fact that the sun's shining. Um, so I'm really quite looking forward to that. Uh, and I'm quite excited at how much traction the um, sustainability 
uh, area is growing uh, and how many people are actually as passionate as I am about it, which is um, it's pretty cool. Awesome, thanks, Phil. Um, hand over to Natalie. Hi there, so um, I'm Natalie Whitehead, one of the founders of Exeter Science Centre, um, and I'm based in Exeter, and I, okay, so what's made me smile this week? Lots of things, but um, I did make a green roof on my shed uh, recently, uh, just last weekend, and now it's filled with bees, and that really, really makes me happy, and to sit, think about uh, the ways we can use our gardens as little havens for wildlife. Thank you. Great, sounds, sounds wonderful. Thanks, Natalie. And Alice. Oh, um, I'm Alice Mills. I'm one of the um, founders and directors of Exeter Science Centre. I live in Barnstable. Um, and what has made me smile this week? Probably similar to that. I love my garden and things are starting to look really cool. I planted some oak, um, some, there's some little acorns a while ago and thought they weren't going to do anything. And they've all sprung up. So I'm really excited. <laughs> I planted them in pots. I don't own like a you know, massive orchard or anything. But like, but yeah, no, I'm very excited about my little oaks. <laughs> Great, sounds wonderful. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Alice. Um, awesome. Yeah, so we're going to be hearing from from all of the speakers in a bit more detail shortly. Um, but just before we do, we do dive in. Um, I just wanted to welcome you to who we are as well. There's some familiar faces and some familiar names in the audience, but um, some new ones as well lots of new ones so that's really exciting so um, I'll just give you a brief background to low carbon Devon um, so as I said my name's Chris and I work on the low carbon Devon project and it's a really exciting project based here at the University in Plymouth and it's a European regional development fund funded project and we're based within the sustainable earth institute here at the university and Low Carbon Devon is all around facilitating and supporting SMEs in Devon to take action on the climate emergency or take action on the climate challenge. So it's a great project and I'm really excited to be involved in it. Um, and as I said, it's based within the Sustainable Earth Institute. And that's that's something here at the university, which is it, it's a unit, it's an institute to focus on collaboration, research and impact and it's an interdisciplinary institute to sort of unite our voice on sustainability um, and showcase what the university is doing but also embed it within everything that we do so it's complements our holistic approach to sustainability here at the university and also this is so this event climate action the time is now we're facilitating um, so really grateful for our speakers coming to talk today and grateful for you coming to be a part of it as well but it's also the first of many events so it's the first of a series of events and workshops kicking off uh, today but happening through the coming weeks months and the next year and a half uh, of the timeline of the project and those are events like this which are focused on sort of bold, um, big systemic change and exploring the sort of speed and scale of change that's required to rise to the climate challenge. But it's not just talk, it's, it's thoughtful talking combined with purposeful doing. So we'll also be looking at running some workshops, some interactive, practical focused, solutions focused workshops, exploring how can we actually put that change into action so it's a combination of this long-term thinking and bold vision combined with local practical solutions focused action through things like carbon footprinting workshops we'll be delivering, um, exploring how SMEs in Devon could become carbon neutral businesses, exploring the B Corp certification and taking businesses through the B Impact Assessment for example, so, so these are just some of the things that are on their way and some of the things that we'll be excited to deliver. So that's what's coming, um, but it's starting today uh, with this event. So super excited to dive in and hand over to our first speaker. 
So that would be Phil, Phil Hawthorne from Red Paddle Co. Take it away, Phil. Hey, Chris, thanks. Um, just let me, uh, can see my screen? Can you see that? We can't see anything at the moment. There we go. Can you see that? Is that better? That's cool. Great. <sighs> Sorry about that. Um, hey, everyone. Like, um, like Chris said, um, I'm Phil Hall, I'm a head designer at Red Paddle Co. Um, I just wanted to um, talk you through a couple of things that we've done, how we've done them, um, and hopefully I'll, I'll try and help out and tell you something that you didn't know. <laughs> So just a quick uh, little bit about me. Um, just let me over that a bit. Uh, um, I've got experience in uh, various um, teams, startups, consultancy in the house. Um, I undertook a, a research position a few years ago, um, um, working on a circular as a circular economy researcher, and I've managed uh, Red's innovation for the last six years. Um, and uh, along with our um, NPD. We've managed to really differentiate from our competitors. Uh, in some cases, uh, some of the offerings we've managed to be able to reduce costs, uh, and we've definitely reduced our overall uh, environmental impact, which is great. So, can I? There we go. Here we are. As I said, um, Red Paddle Co. We're the home of the world's leading inflatable stand-up paddle boards, uh, and we're dedicated to delivering the very best sup experience in the world. So quick, uh, one of the main things I wanted to talk to you today is about the circular economy. Uh, hopefully some of you know about the circular economy, but if you don't, I wanted to cover it anyway because it's something that I feel very passionate about. Uh, here on the left, um, sorry, let me get rid of the Here on the left, uh, we've got the traditional butterfly diagram, which is from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Now, if you don't know about these guys, I highly recommend you check them out because these they're the leading authority uh, or one of them anyway and uh, they're based in the UK uh, but uh, they've got a global reach so one of the things the, the main thing about the circular economy is um, we, we, we it, it's, it consists of two spheres here so you've got the biosphere here on the left and the technosphere here on the right and the idea is that we have, uh, we have nutrients, we have materials that can go into the system that we, we process. Uh, and, and we need to make sure that we can extend the life of those materials or, or we can um, eat more easily recover those materials. So um, the biosphere would be something, say, for example, that, that's natural, that grows, that's fibrous. So you could say wood or cotton or any natural fiber that you could put in the ground and it would become plant food, nutrients ready for its next uh, stage. Uh, and then the technosphere, again, is, is, is plastics, is uh, metals, is, is anything that's man-made. And we need to be able to recover those um, and reuse them as much as possible. Now, here on the right, we, we've done a very simple overview um, of uh, just to demonstrate the fact that when we do mix the biosphere and the technosphere, that is when we generate waste. And that is what we want to try and avoid at the highest level, really, because it's that, it's that waste that we need to make sure that we don't make. Uh, and there's a few um, product lifecycle strategies you can do um, to, to mitigate those, those um, scenarios where you can't um, keep those two separate. So there we go. So what is a sustainable product? Um, I just put some few notes down there. The, it's durable, easy, upgradable, repairable. Uh, it's resource efficient, so it, it's not overkill. I mean, you're using just the right amount of material for the right job it's got to do. Um, being sustainable doesn't mean that you have to have paper straws or braskets or use composting toilets. It's being, being sustainable, being ethical, being responsible. It shouldn't have to be. Um, a sacrifice it shouldn't have to be a compromise it should be why, why can't you have a 40 minute shower if if the building you're in is not only producing enough energy for that shower but also producing more energy to put back into the system it's 
I think uh, some of the misconceptions that I've found is, is people think that being eco and sustainable is, is being a, a tree hugger and it, it's not the case. It's, it's, it's the new norm. I mean, it's just, it's how it is. So but going back to it, we need to make sure for, for hard for products anyway, um, we, can, we can reuse these, these materials and make sure they're as recoverable as possible. So what have we done so far? Um, we make the best boards in the world. Uh, and one of the biggest wins that we've done so far is we've made, uh, we've we've managed to work away at getting our um, uh, our warranty rate down from sixteen, just over sixteen percent in twenty fifteen, right down to it hovers around 03 to point five percent currently. Which means the products that we are using, because um, the main material that we use is a composite, we can't easily recover that yet. So we've got to try and make that and got to extend the product life as long as possible uh, and keep that in the circle. Um, and the proof is, is, is there. We, we, it's not perfect, but we are definitely um, taking steps to be better. Um, and, but in our other products and the, and the boards themselves, we've utilised, as I said, the product life cycle strategies, um, which have helped us improve our current products and develop new products. So here's a few examples. Um, one of which is, as I've mentioned, is extending the life of that product. So we now have a website uh, dedicated to spare component parts that anyone around the world can, can access and buy and extend the life of their product. Um, it, it's more affordable for the customer. It, it gives us a chance to um, shine with our, our, our customer service and, and, and enhance the power of the brand. Um, and it, as I said, it extends the life of the product. And we've got we've got a couple of others here. Um, responsible um, resource selection. So um, the the products that you the, the materials that you do need to use, if if the if the um, the supplier that you're getting them from is is also responsible, that's a big shoulder. Um, uh, for example, our um, our active jacket here uses Blue Sign. Now Blue Sign is um, is a factory accreditation uh, for fabrics. That uses less pollutants. It's more energy effective. It's reduced water consumption. It's 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 a more progressive fabric. Um, and likewise, it's the same as fabrication methods. So here we've got our shredder valve adapter, uh, or our, our our packaging, um, our fin protectors. So um, this shredder valve adapter uses is no glue. So again, we're not mixing materials. We're we're trying to keep things clean. This is just an interference um, press fit. So it's designed for rapid fabrication, uh, easy recovery, um, and it, it reduces manufacturing costs and time, and, and it just makes things easier if you can do it. Um, and likewise with packaging, it's, 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 we use mechanical fixings, we don't use adhesives. Um, and as I said, the, the, the cardboard there would be biosphere, and an ink would traditionally be technosphere, but because we use a soy-based ink, it's a biosphere. So that can be uh, more easily recovered at its end of life. Uh, again, also we've got, we've got single use um, stainless steel 316 here. It's vacuum form, it's welded. Um, so at its end of life, it can be easily recovered. Now, um, when I mentioned earlier about uh, using the right amount of materials, what we can do is we can uh, digitally FEA um, simulate our products to um, make sure that we're using the right amount of material in the places it needs to be because if we're using more material than we need to then that's 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 over consumption isn't it so if we calculate um how a product's going to perform uh, where we need that material be more effective uh, we, we reduce the amount of material we use um, so this is a, a um, an example of initial foot for our for our new titan 2 pump um, which leads me on to the next bit is designing things for disassembly, easy recovery. So each part of this pump can be easily serviced and repaired, but it can also be easily recovered at its end of life, as well as um, all the materials that we use are pure materials. Um, so a lot in the water sports industry, we um, a lot of companies can add uh, fiberglass to the plastics, which makes them strong, but again, you're mixing those materials uh, and you're trying to, uh, it's more difficult to, to uh, separate those at the end of life. So these materials um, we've, we've, we've made as pure as possible. So at the end of life, we can, we can regrind them. They can be injected again or, or process and recover them. We're, we're extending the life of that material. 
And we also don't mix materials with um, sort of stickers or adhesives. Well, we, we, we're trying to reduce the amount anyway. So, so this is our compact paddle, um, which we have actually um, managed to laser etch. As with our RSS pattern here, we can laser etch uh, onto the onto the um, product, so it's um, it's it's not coming off. It's a tattoo, <laughs> in essence. Um, it's durable, but also we're not actually adding and mixing material. So there's there's lots of different strategies we can use to to make these products as responsible as, as we can. And then finally, the compact is our 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 shining star. It 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 it, it gathers a a lot of these strategies in one. So it's got the DFD pump. It's got the single material. Uh, compact uh, uh, the paddle it's got a pure material fin um, and also because of the nature of the compact it's cut it off here but the and traditional paddle board would be sort of a large uh, 100 litre backpack whereas as the compact which is cut off here it's um, considerably smaller so we can actually it's more transportable for the user it's uh, but also it's more transportable when we're shipping them so we can actually fit more on a pallet in a container um, and obviously the, uh, we use a little less energy transporting the board commercially. What we're currently working on, uh, we're trying to quantify and improve our entire supply chain upstream and downstream. Um, this, this, this goes along with chemical, ethical and social governance. Uh, and we're also actually currently working with uh, Devon Contract Waste just in Exeter um, to see uh, how and what we can uh, recapture and recover um, materials in order to close that loop uh, and make things as, as circular as possible. We've got a couple of projects working with uh, local universities uh, and hopefully, as Chris mentioned earlier, um, we're going to try and uh, we're applying for the B certifi certification and going to try and do some full uh, in-depth LCAs on our, our products to see if we can hone in on and fine tune any more products that we've currently got. Uh, what can you do? if? If, if I can tell you nothing else um, today, it would be uh, get some metrics about where you are um, and try and try and get the smartest and the quickest wins. Um, uh, identify the areas of waste and just try and reduce these as much as possible before before you start anything. Um, but um, from a design background, I would always sort of say start from the very beginning because that's the cheapest and quickest way. Uh, to to have a, a, the, the greatest impact, really. Um, but also at the same time, it, it's got to be commercially viable. There's no point in, in bringing something to market that's, that's super eco, but no one's going to buy it and it's too expensive to make. So again, it, it's, it's, it's trying to find that balance of, of um, getting it to market, really. And again, uh, I think about uh, not only at work, but at home, because you're also consumers. So um, buying habits is obviously the greatest uh, asset we've got. Um, and just finally, just a, a quick quote uh, from uh, Bill McDonough, he's, he's one of the godfathers uh, of circular economy, for all children of all species for all time. Uh, it's something that I try and, and live by and I've put a couple of links there that um, I think we can probably try and share at the end, which is just a couple of articles to help out. Thanks a lot. Great. Awesome. Thanks, Phil. Um, thanks so much, Phil. That was awesome. I love the um, the sort of title of that as taking steps and that recognizing that it's a journey. Um, and also the just starting from the start there about yeah, designing for disassembly and the circular economy approach. It's really great to see that um, and hear that from you. So that's awesome. Um, we're going to come back to Phil at the end for questions. So if you've got any questions for Phil or any of the speakers, apologies, I should have mentioned this at the start, do feed them in to the chat or wait to the end and we can, we can ask those questions. So, so I'll be keeping an eye on the chat. Um, so if you've got any questions for Phil or any of the other speakers, then do pop them in the chat or, or ask them at the end in the Q&A. We're, we're going to keep the flow going and go, go move on to um, Natalie and Alice from Exeter Science Centre. Um, and also I just wanted to say a huge thank you to my colleague Hayley, who's keeping an eye on the chat as well. Um, Hayley Holt, who's been great in organising today's event. So if there are any technical issues, 
um, do get in touch with Hayley or, or, put, or liaise with either myself or Hayley in the chat. Um, and also, just, just to follow on from what Phil just said, he mentioned about the life cycle analysis and, and B Corp certification. I'm actually working with Phil through the Low Carbon Devon internship and leadership program. So that's an area we can support local SMEs in Devon. So if you're in the audience and want to know more about that, then I'm really open to, to having a chat further with you. And I'm also been talking to Alice and Natalie around that as well. So I'll hand over to Alice and Natalie from Exeter Science Centre. Great. Thank you, Chris. I'm just going to share my screen. Hope it works. Can you all see that all right? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, brilliant. Great. So thank you so much for having us. Really, really kind of you. And that was a fantastic talk from Phil. So, um, yeah, we are Exeter Science Centre. Um, and we are trying to create a STEAM discovery centre in Exeter, where STEAM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, Maths and Medicine. Um, I'm Dr Alice Mills. I'm one of the co-founders and co-directors. Um, I have a PhD in astrophysics. And after that, I spent five years as a science outreach officer for the University of Exeter. Um, and that's where I met Natalie. And we realised we had this shared passion for, for sharing STEAM um, research and industry with people and for just raising awareness of global issues in a, in a positive way so that people feel that they understand them and, and know how to help tackle them. So, um, so yeah, over to Nat. Um, so hi everyone, um, I'm Natalie Whitehead, the other founder of the Exeter Science Centre. Um, I completed my PhD in, in theoretical physics in September 2019 and since then I've been working on this exciting project full time. Um, we are a community interest company and at the moment we're transitioning over to a charity um, and I think on, on this slide here you can see our amazing team of founding trustees um, who are from a range of backgrounds including education, research, industry, enterprise and the arts as well. We also have a team of advisors who are very kindly providing ad hoc support for us as well. So our mission as the Exeter Science Centre is to educate, motivate and empower the public to make a difference in the world. And a huge motivator for us is the necessity to get the public on board with tackling climate change and other global challenges um, in general by informing them about the science behind it. And really, that's to help them understand what needs to be done and why, um, and also to help them become more resilient to myths and disinformation, um, and also so they can like uh, make more informed choices in their own lives, whether that's at work or at home um, and everything else in between. Um, we're trying to do that by connecting the public with um, research and industry in STEAM, so science, tech and engineering, arts, and maths and medicine especially in the region, because by, by presenting all, all of this kind of, um, you know, exciting research and industry that's going on right here, that's a, a really great way to inspire people to show what other people are working on and, and how they can get involved as well. We especially as well want to present global issues in a factual, but really optimistic and positive manner. Um, we're also really motivated by the awesome things that are going on in the region already. I mean, we've, we've already had uh, Phil's amazing talk. I'm looking forward to Andy's as well. Um, and we're really determined to, to help the public connect with these amazing initiatives going on right here as well. Cool, so what are we up to? So, um, so as Nat said, we, we've been a registered community interest company since February 2020, which wasn't the best time to set up anything <laughs> because then everything went a bit wrong. <laughs> but we are doing two parallel streams of work. One is where we're running our organization, which is um, developing public engagement programs um, with community and um, with schools to help them connect to the amazing STEAM research and industry in the region, um, and also to raise uh, awareness and support for our ambition to build an actual physical science centre. So if any of you haven't been to a science centre before, our nearest ones are, there's We the Curious in Bristol, there's the Eden Project in Cornwall, and there's the um, National Marine Aquarium in Plymouth. Um, and they're all great examples of, of science centres. They have more specific, uh, well, the Marine Aquarium and, um, and Eden Project have more specific kind of areas that they cover, but we're passionate about having a, a general STEAM discovery centre. And it's really a place for people to connect in an engaging, 
way um, and a hands-on way with science. We want it to be just a really friendly environment where, where all people feel feel welcome and feel like they're they're sort of part of making a change. Um, so yeah, so this this is just a, a, some vision images on this mood board really of, of inspiration that we take from some fantastic science centers around the world. And you can see, we just want it to be really hands-on to have a, a wonderful um, STEM and arts crossover. Um, so people are aware of the creativity of, of STEM. Um, lots of flexible spaces that we can use for, for performance, for conferences, for workshops, for upskilling people um, and repair cafes. And, and then there's a picture of a vertical farm there. We love the idea of trying to grow some of the food for the cafe in the actual centre so people can see how you can grow in an, in an urban environment. Um, so, yeah, those are just some, some dream images. Um, and in terms of the outside, we take a lot of inspiration from Plymouth uh, Sustainability Hub and the Green Wall. But we love the idea of creating this real kind of beacon of change in, in the city that's got a rooftop garden with bees and, and algae panels and green walls and just just somewhere that people go, wow, that's amazing. Because cities don't need to be boring and they don't need to be grey. They can be green. Um, and so, yeah, that's our kind of bad idea. <laughs> but we, um, in terms of the projects we're doing at the moment, we've got, we're working with quite a few academics to directly connect people with their research. Um, and we're also um, planning a pop-up exhibition in August. So it'd be so nice to actually see people in person, it all being well. And um, that's centered around um, climate change because Exeter is a globally recognized center for climate science with some of the, the real world, like most of the sort of world leading global, uh, world leading climate scientists are in Exeter. And we really want to highlight that, highlight that for people and, and help them to feel a connection to that incredible research going on. Um, but also sort of tackle climate change at a community level and share stories of how it impacts people here, not just, you know, when we see sort of drought stricken places, but but really like here, how is it affecting us, us now? So, um, so yeah, that's an exciting project. And we're also doing another project connecting school children to engineers, um, particularly focusing on the engineering behind um, energy generation so fossil fuel free energy generation so we're doing these virtual sort of virtual field trips for um for schools um so yeah that's some of our projects at the moment but um we're in the early stages of setting up the organization and growing our team and and uh, looking for funding really <laughs> but we've got big aims <laughs> And so the, the next thing we've been asked to kind of discuss a little is how is this inspiring action to a zero carbon future? Um, and I suppose for us, the first step is understanding the problem as individuals. Why do we need a zero carbon future and seeing the relevance of it in our own lives at home and at work? And that's what we're trying to achieve. We really think that science centres are the ones that have the hugely important role of inspiring the public about science, connecting them with the experts, um, and also bringing the public on board with this really exciting vision of the future, if we can all work together to make that happen. Um, so we're really determined to have an impact right now through the activities that we're doing. And, and as Alice has mentioned, we're trying to create a physical center as well. And then hopefully we'll have a much, much larger impact of maybe, you know, 500,000 visitors or so a year, plus any uh, additional from uh, our online activities, which are gonna be a really important part of what we're doing. Um, and by having a presence in the center of Exeter, we can kind of connect people with, with all this amazing climate expertise on the doorstep and also the amazing steam expertise in the entire region. Um, and also we don't just want to reach the public. We're also very, very keen to have an, a positive impact for other organizations as well. We kind of want our approach of making a new uh, charitable organisation with ethical policies and activities. We really want that whole process to be as transparent as possible. And partly what we feel is that by saving others uh, from duplicating uh, the effort of, of coming up with policies or, or working out ways of doing things, that's another way that we can have an impact um, as the time can then be better spent on doing some good things for other people. So that's part of the reason why we have our business plan fully on our website. It's preliminary at the moment, but hoping to finalise that again soon. Um, and in future, we want to help, help make our policies um, and our rationale for how we operate really open source, along with any other resources we produce. Um, and that includes the blueprint for making a science centre as well. So other people can make amazing science centres um, elsewhere. We're really hope, hoping that that will encourage others to kind of, um, you know, to, to make it a kind of open source and pay it forward attitude um, to, to operating as, a, as an organisation. Over to you, Alice. 
So um, Chris sent us some really good questions to kind of think about when we were talking and um, and one of them was, um, how is this leading to transformational and regenerative impact for people and planet to flourish? So uh, fun fundamentally, if we can build in a time of terrible misleading information in terms of science, I mean, we've been throughout the pandemic overwhelmed with just terrible apparently scientific facts. Um, so if we can build people's trust in scientists and their understanding of science, then hopefully they'll see the relevance of science in their own lives and and this will motivate them to make simple but very impactful changes which you know, collect, collectively could have a, a huge impact on the planet. So this could be from who you vote for at a national and local level to, to how much you throw away to turning the tap off when you brush your teeth, simple things that can have a, an effect. Um, so it's very important to us that we grow this organisation from the grassroots. So we are very passionate about public consultation that, that leads to the public genuinely moulding what we end up creating so that what we create is a place that is genuinely useful, enjoyable and accessible for all and has harnessed the opinions and perspectives of people from all ages and backgrounds. So, um, so we're working hard on that and, uh, and applying for various grants to really reach into communities and, um, and reach people who maybe wouldn't normally decide to go to a science centre for the day, but, but just make it somewhere that is a genuinely useful cultural hub for people where they feel welcome. So, um, so yeah, we hope that could lead to, to quite a big impact. Um, yeah, nah. The next one is, um, what does your imagination of a zero carbon future look like? Um, I suppose for us, it's not just about um, you stopping the use of fossil fuels. Of course, that's really important. But we, we really want to see a future where people and businesses are more conscious of the impact they have on, on pe other people and the planet and trying to minimise the impact and just working together to make a difference. I feel like we're, we're much stronger and can make much more of a difference as a, as a team. Um, and of course, we also have the vision of uh, towns and cities that are good for people people and nature, lots of walking, cycling, electric transport, trees and bee highways everywhere. And also, of course, buildings that aren't just big lumps of concrete and glass. We'd love to see green roofs, roof gardens, green walls and, and sustainable building materials just being more widespread. And of course, that's really motivating our vision for the Science Centre building as well. And Chris asks us, what is the positive and proactive change you would like to see? And how can SMEs, local businesses, business leaders um, be at the forefront of that change? So to us, I think it's we would just love to see people being progressive in terms of their values when whatever they're doing, ensuring that profits are not the only driving force. Phil made the good point that you do, you know, you do need to obviously there's no point in producing a product that, that is not profitable. Um, but but there can be so many other driving forces <laughs> behind um, behind your organization or your, your company. So, um, and collaborative working. Um, we're so keen to, to bring together industry, research, the public, so that we can all join together. And I think you can, you can form incredibly productive relationships that way. Um, so, so yeah, that's something we're very passionate about. And, and connection with the public and transparency. So often it is very hard. I don't know, you get the, the huge climate guilt thing and you get the, the, you know, you, I, I just certainly end up getting into spiraling into this kind of overthinking every purchase. And, and it would be so nice if the companies were doing that for me. <laughs> and if I just knew that I can trust the supply chain. And so, so if, if all companies were, in, in, were transparent like that um, and had transparent policies for how they treat their staff, all these things, then I would know that the product I was buying or the, you know, or the experience I was having was, um, was fair in every way and was and was not negatively impacting on the environment. So, um, so yeah, I think that transparency is, is is I would just love to see that in everything. So I think that's it from us at the moment. So the, the key kind of things that we want to express, I suppose, are that you know engaging with the public is really important to get them on board with tackling global issues. But we also have a huge impact as as people running organisations or being part of organisations, um, and we can make a huge impact that way as well through helping each other and helping and, and engaging with the public. Thanks very much for listening. Great. Thanks, uh, Alice and Natalie. That was really lovely. Um, it's so great to just see that sort of positive vision. Um, and I think that's just just so refreshing. And that's what we need. Um, although, you know, we are in a climate emergency, or a biodiversity emergency, or however you want to frame it, there is so much amazing stuff happening, and that we can do. 
and that's really the ethos which is what i wanted to bring to invite you because it's a, that solutions focused practical action that we can really sort of take hold of and engage with um so really lovely yeah thank you and so really that stuck out for me that you mentioned was around open source and collaboration and for me that's one of the things we need to see a lot more of is that sort of putting stuff out there learning by doing and learning together and that sense of you know we, we, we are in an emergency but we do have solutions but we can build on those solutions by sharing our learning and by asking questions asking why how so it's, it's yeah that collaboration for me is key um so it's a really really great point you touched upon as well so awesome thank you um similarly to phil uh, if you've got any questions for either alice or natalie pop them in the chat or we can we can delve into those at the q a in the end um so thanks again alice and natalie we'll dive straight in to andy and andy middleton over to you great thank you Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, great, great to join you. Okay, so you should get the slides, got to see the slides there perfectly, okay? Yeah. Right, so, so the essence of um, what I wanna talk through today is this kind of critical need to be really bold in what we do. And I think, you know, the dandelion clock on Earth Day is a good reminder of, of both how much needs to be done and, and, and of the ticking of that, the ticking of that time. And, so, so a quick, quick piece of reference. So my part of my time and a lot of my working career had been developing this amazing adventure business on the west coast of Wales called TYF. We're one of the, we're, we're probably lead, we're in the leading pack in the sector, I guess, in terms of what we're doing around ethics and environment. We're the second oldest Patagonia retailer in the UK, founding B Corp and all of this stuff. And we're most definitely nowhere near being a sustainable business. And the, the goal for us is not to be a sustainable business but to become one that's part of a group of businesses that are regenerating the stability of climate and nature. And my experiences come from a variety of these different elements, kind of from being avalanched when I was learning how to, badly learning how to be a mountaineer, to practicing rescue work. And when I was a member of the lifeboat crew in St. David's, by being a, an exploration geologist in a gold mine in Australia, and you know, with colleagues down here, pioneering the sport of coasteering and climbing around the cliffs and the sea. And what all of those things told me was that the best time to prepare for risks ahead is before you need to use those skills. And my take is that if, if the journey ahead of us was a whitewater river, you know, whitewater kayaking, there are six grades of difficulty from one, which is gently moving water to class six, where if you get it wrong, you'll die. In terms of our species right now, we're about to head into a class six rapid. And the strange thing is that most people haven't even yet practiced on the lake at the top of the river. So we've got a completely different scale of thinking and acting needed around the skills that we need. And on that journey, I just want to mention being really careful to watch out for the magic mirror. And what I mean by this is that the world that we used to look out on to see what was going on got replaced by corporates and businesses by a magic mirror that gave you the answers that they wanted to hear. So when you talk about all of this declaration about net carbon and about regenerative businesses and doing less harm, this is being done by businesses that cause harm, but want you to get to believe that they're not. The entire framework of global environmental legislation was never intended to create good outcomes for my grandchildren born last year. And so one of the lessons for me is that when we're gonna set out about making change is to never ever try to half jump. When you're leaping off cliffs, the one thing you've got to do is fully commit to that jump. And, and doing the jump is actually what gets you into the deepest, safest water and keeps safe. And this is not a time for hesitancy. So in the bigger picture piece, most of you on this call, I would guess, would be aware of the broad idea of donut economics and the great work being done by, by Kate Roweth and colleagues at the Donut Economics Action Lab. And I think we need to kind of reframe the idea of first aid, which many of us will have been taught in the past around airway, breathing and circulation. And the first aid course for donut thinking or for the planet is for me is around being aware or alert about being brave and being curious and asking better questions of the things and the people and ourselves around us. 
There's two quick pieces on that. One from James Bevan, who's chief exec at the Environment Agency, and the other from Chris Hadfield, astronaut. James Bevan, our thinking needs to change faster than the climate. And our response, need, our response needs to match the scale of the challenge. Chris Hadfield saying, I pitch the most demanding challenge and visualize what I'd need to know how to meet it. Then I practice until I reach competence. When I'm comfortable, I'll be able to perform. I never stop getting ready just in case. And I think the question for us as organizational leaders, as employees, as community representatives, is to understand that piece about what our response would look like when it matches the scale of the challenge and how do we prepare for that in terms of the pictures we make, the arguments we have, the stories we tell, because we have to get ready for what's happening now as well as what's coming. This is the framework I use when I'm talking to ministers and business leaders, schools and so on. Simple framework, left hand axis, the Y axis is performance, however we choose to judge it. The X axis is either doing what the rules require or what the reality is that's knocking on our door at the moment. And in the top left is broadly speaking, the space that you're allowed to operate in and the profit making business sticking within the legislation. And without any criticism of, of, of Big Red or Patagonia or anyone else, it's quite legal to make products and use them that you cannot recycle because the standards that we make them by are wrong because we don't measure the externalities. Government in the bottom left is stuck by the limitations of democracy, so it can't set out really big goals. In the bottom right-hand corner is where a lot of activists, community groups and academics sit without brilliant insights, but never went to the school of getting shit done, learning marketing, social media, finance, leadership, project management, to know how to take ideas to scale. And they're further hamstrung by the fact that funding is short term and only, only paid out on projects that people already know the answer to. The space that really interests me is this area in the top right, what we call R10, which is where reality meets 10 out of 10 performance and asks, what would you set out to do if you knew what was needed and also knew that you couldn't fail? And I just wanna give a couple of examples of what that might look like. So at a tiny level in our shop in St. David's, we have an ethical outdoor shop in St. David's along the adventure business. And we've just, with some support from our government, set up a global repair center, planetary repair center. Clothes create 4% of global CO2. Customers can now come in and repair their own clothes for free or leave them with us to, to fix for a cost to keep things going for longer. And what we're starting to do is invite people to our next birth, to our biggest birthday party, which will be our 200th anniversary as a business in 2186. And that, the people going to that, bar, that party will be the grandchildren of my grandchildren. We've got to think in many, more, many, many more generations to start understanding this. So at a Wales level, working on this really exciting project called Wales Transition Lab, where we're trying to bring together the whole country around food, health, and nature. And the weird thing is, is that although there's apparently some relationship between food and health outcomes, the farming organizations have never yet sat down to talk with health. The NGOs aren't allowed to talk to farmers. The NGOs never talk to health. So we're creating a safe space for the people who are managing the system to talk and listen to each other. And we're doing that in partnership with UCL's Climate Action Lab up in London. One of the other projects that really makes me smile is this lovely small project called Big Box Boyd in Welsh. It's Big Food Project, Big Food Box. It's a converted shipping container in schools that serves, serves out fair share food surplus from supermarkets on a pay-as-you-feel basis. And our goal is that in every child in 75% of the schools in Wales to be food literate in five years' time. Because we believe that food literacy and about awareness of the relationship between food and climate, food and waste, food in your body, food and envir environmental outcomes is absolutely vital if we're going to take this forwards and move the game on. Because we believe if you can get the foundations right, you can build some amazing outcomes on that. And we can do it at an incredibly low cost. One of my favourite examples of any business is this one in Brighton called Hisby. Hisby stands for how it should be in the supermarket rebels. The sweet thing is the number in white here. Hisby put 11.5 times the benefit into their community that, that the big box supermarkets do. 
And when you take into account the fact the average supermarket spend is 35 quid a week per household, these are enormous quantities of money. When you look at what would happen to Devon, if you chose to relocate food in the places that it matters and take out half of the packaging of the supermarket, reduce your, reduce your supply chain carbon, reduce your waste and optimize the local benefit. And here's a weird one. In the world of pollution caused by cars and smokestacks that causes 8 million deaths a year, there's a thing called Ventolin, which some of you will be using. It's an asthma drug. And the, there's a Ventolin, single use of a Ventolin container has the same carbon impact as a 175 mile car journey, where every puff of Ventolin is the same as about a fifth of a pint of petrol. But the weird thing is, this is 40 times less inefficient than an existing product that uses dry mist that's also on the market. So when we're setting out our ambition, let's make sure that we don't look for 4% improvement or 40% improvement, because sometimes we can be looking for things that are 40 times better, not four times better. So my question to share with you, I guess, is to invite you with colleagues at a county scale at a regional level to ask this question. If you took into account all of the evidence of what's happening about climate and the impact that has on nature and on communities, on your rivers, on your own well-being, and particularly that of future generations, what would you set out to do for your business, your community, and your, your, your family if you knew that you couldn't fail? Talk about that, share it, start talking to other people, and it's on the back of that that the first steps will happen. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks, Andy. Um, that was really great. Um, I love seeing the your mention of donut economics. There, there is um, a group here in Devon looking at a Devon donut. Um, so if, if you want to know more about that and anyone's in the audience, do get in touch with me um, because it's a, it's a super great framing. And also love that, that piece around thinking for the long term. And we've discussed this before about cathedral thinking and people who built cathedrals is called cathedral thinking because they wouldn't see the completion of that cathedral or this notion of seven generation thinking and thinking for the long term. So I'm really, really glad you mentioned that. And um, I look forward to passing that invite on to your 200th um, celebration. Absolutely. It'd be a pleasure to have you there in, <laughs> in, in, in the genes, if not in person. <laughs> yeah. Um, it would be great to bring the other speakers in at this point and we can we can have a discussion if Phil, Natalie and Alice. And if you've got questions for anyone, do pop them in the chat or reach out. Um, you can also ask your question in person um, if you raise your hand and Hayley will keep an eye on that in the chat as well as me. Um, but just to kick us off, I've got a question for each of you, um, which is around, you know, if you could give everyone a skill, if you could give everyone in the world a skill to tackle climate change, whether it's a physical skill or a soft skill, if you like. Can, what, it, be a, can it be a superpower? <laughs> what, what would it be and why? Do you want to kick us off then, Andy? I... I'd like them. I'd like them to be able to stand in the shoes of my grandchildren's grandchildren and look back and tell them what they need to do to get to, so that they live in a safe world. I like that. Awesome. Yeah. And what about you, um, Alice? Gosh, I don't know. <laughs> There's so many things. Um. Ah. Oh filtering out the rubbish like as in there's just with the internet there is just so and social media and everything there's so much rubbish out there so the skill of being able to filter through all that and find the truth and find the the facts and that would be yeah at the moment I think that's a pretty important skill <laughs> mm. yeah, I know what you mean um yeah I think that's what we can learn from the natural environment as well just just for me, it would be listening, um, listening clearly. 
Um, so maybe that's related related to what you're saying there, seeing clearly, but that starts with listening clearly and mm. listening to the to the rhythms, the sounds, and then how 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 we can apply that through our through our work. Um, uh, Natalie, what what about you? It's a really difficult question. I've been trying to think of things. Um, I suppose the the skill of being able to make decisions with, I, as a, maybe I'm just tying in the what everybody else has said here, but but being able to make decisions which kind of seem, you know, they might be really hard to do. For example, giving up meat or reducing meat consumption, or or not going on that flight. You know, you really want to go on holiday somewhere exotic. You know why would you we've got beautiful Devon on our doorstep but you know you you might want to go for these things and kind of t having the the skill or the ability to kind of say I'm going to do an alternative which is better for the planet and and better for for other people or something that would be that would be wonderful it's difficult to do because you know you think well everyone else is going on holiday and things like that but if everybody made that decision not to take that flight or to cut down on their meat consumption or something then that would make a huge impact collectively yeah that's a very difficult question that's cool no yeah thanks thanks Natalie that sounds cool um Phil what about you I think all these are very very similar aren't they um because I think mine mine would be um the fact that consumerism it would the power would be to see uh, if I'm stood here um, I mean, I can only see step two, three and four, but really I would love to be able to feel, see, acknowledge step 10, because I think that, I mean, why does light, I don't care about turning off a light switch, why should I? I mean, does it, it doesn't save that much energy, millivolts, well, yeah, but if a million people do it, or 10 million people, or a billion people do it, and it's that it's that link in the chain. It's the fact that it would be to increase our our perception of 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 the the, the system um, more than two or three steps. It would span over space and time. It would just be um, it'd be pretty cool. Just like like the others have said, it would make things happen. And um, I mean, it's the same as if if you could. Oh, the other one would be. I mean, can I have two? Um, is, um, <laughs> it would be to make all all um, exhaust fumes purple. That's what I'd love. Yeah. I think, Phil, that the, I think one of Bill McDonough's things about exhaust fumes is to say, put the exhaust back inside the car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's loads. Yeah, you could just go, you could just go nuts. I just keep going. But... <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, I love that about just seeing your, um, yeah, I guess there's something in there, isn't there, about realising the impact you have, um, that collective impact, what you're talking there about those steps. Um, yeah, I mean, and just being creative as well. Um, that sounds really cool. Um, we do have a question, actually. I'll start, I'll go on to you, Phil, again, but, the, but then the others can come in as well afterwards, which is from John, um, which is around extended producer responsibility and it's do you think um epr or extended producer responsibility should be made compulsory or, or mandatory for all manufacturers now, i'm hoping you might say yes but um what do you think of that absolutely uh, i think it should be law um but uh as as a, as a manufacturer the goal would be to make every producer, supplier, manufacturer, whatever you want to call them, um, responsible for the atom uh, that they're supplying. Because uh, again, it's a case of say, say the pump, say, say this pump. Um, if we were, cause, because at the, at the same time, if you, if you, if you, if you sell it. The problem with a lot of, well, all companies at the minute is once you sell it, it's not your problem. It's not my problem what happens. Well, it is, and it should be, because that's the whole point. 
it just your your my commitment as a manufacturer as a supplier shouldn't end as soon as it crosses hands i should be responsible for that molecule um, and what happens to it um i think we're a long way off yet um but again hopefully the systems are, are growing and hopefully exponentially that that it comes because that would that would in itself push innovation um but again i think we were talking about it the other day it, it comes from the people um because um, we need to impact and um, create demand for the policy wake makers to wake up and go oh this is a thing um because they're not going to do it on their own um and it, it's sort of coming down from the top of the triangle but also from the bottom up as well and we can meet in the middle but yeah definitely 100 percent, absolutely can i pick up on that um if, if i might chris yeah, I mean, okay. what's interesting um you were talking earlier, Phil, in your presentation about like the about the tiny level of of kind of of comeback on the products because they because they work, like you know a tiny number. And I guess for me, what's the bit of co-design we've got to do is is working out is, is the problem is it's too cheap to buy stuff, even even relative expensive kit like surfboards or paddle boards, and we've got to stop people wanting to own things, but instead. Uh, uh, buy the ability to use them. And so I think for me, the really yeah. spot is PSS. buying high quality kits that's yeah. repairable yeah. and then just not owning it unless you use it every day type stuff. So that customer, like, so custom, we, we've just set up a, a hire center in St. David's that's renting out barbecues, not because we expect to make a load of money on, but we hate seeing the supermarkets stacked with disposable barbecues. Whether it's a barbecue or a suck board, to know that you can go on a holiday and have an amazing time by bike, knowing that you don't need to buy all of this stuff and actually to make, make it rentable, make it fixable, and do that in partnership with, with the manufacturers, in effect, to dematerialize the recreation and, and tourism economy completely. And we, we did some rough numbers down here on what my local surf beach at White Sands to work out and ask people, how much would they pay per person for a week's unlimited use of kit on the beach, you know, surfboards, frisbees, windbreaks, whatever, and it's like a couple hundred quid a week per head if we had everything available. And you could turn a business worth, that's worth nothing, the scratch by cabin hire business into like two or three hundred thousand pound business on one beach and, I mean, and, and take out 90 percent of the molecules. So this, we need this, to rethink it. It's, it's about transitional steps, because I think uh, this was part of the Innovate UK project uh, that I did was um, with being and and suggested that um we we um when you when you want to use an item you want to use a good item so if you were if you were using a you could buy a, a, a chop saw or a mitre saw you, you could buy a hundred pound one but it wouldn't get you a lot or you could buy a three four hundred pound makita one but you've only got to do one job so why can't you just give them the item and sell them the consumable um, as a, as a, so they would pay for the saw or the drill bit and you could give them access to the drill because all they want to do is they want to drill a hole. They don't want to buy oh, a drill. Oh, exactly, yeah, yeah. They want a hole. Um, and it's about access, isn't it? And it's about taking steps on multiple levels to try and get to that. Yeah, does that, does that come into your educational approach through the Exeter Science Centre in terms of that focus on... It's like what we mentioned earlier, isn't it? Collaboration, but sharing and that reusability or um, renting, I guess, in a way. Is, is that a component of what the Exeter Science Centre will be? We love those ideas, by the way. Um, I think certainly in the, we're factoring into our business plan in terms of the exhibits um, that they would be... You know, if you have to replace the entire exhibit every time because you want to keep exhibits fresh you don't want people to come every few months ago oh, i saw this last time but but that doesn't mean you want to chuck away so we've been looking into schemes of sharing exhibits with other museums and other centers um so they kind of cycle around also doing things simple things like making the base of an exhibit something that um is always there but then you can screw on different bits on top of it basically you know so that kind of thing I think that yeah not having to replace things every time but I love I, we we really love the idea of hosting repair cafes and um you know using people's community skills and and uh, and it would all tie into Phil's idea of making something that is repairable in the first place you know <laughs> so so yeah I think that all those ideas are, are very important and uh, we'd love to sort of feed them all into into our plans but um 
yeah I love I, I'm trying to think of what we what things we could lend out but I love the idea I really love the idea of, of that <laughs> Nat have you got anything you want That's- to I suppose as well, it's also making people aware that these initiatives exist. Maybe even we'd have people who've set up repair um, kind of shops or, or whatever, or have these higher out places who come and visit and do, a, do an inspiring talk or have an exhibit or have a, um, you know, a, a thing in the foyer for a bit or whatever that, that shows people that this can be done. We're really keen for that, you know, whether it's charities or not for profits or just organisations doing good things, kind of just to say, we, we've done it and this is how you can do it as well. And it might just spark that bit of inspiration for people who visit us to say, oh, actually, you know, maybe I could just set up a, you know, a little higher shop. I think there are things going on in Exeter about this. It's really, really exciting because it can be done on a community level. You don't need to have any business, uh, previous business skills. You can just, you know, there's lots of help out there. So, yeah, definitely want to facilitate that as, as much as we can. I think there's some great stuff in the chat as well about existing repair cafes in Plymouth. And so that's really cool. Um, yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Okay. One, one thing I one thing I think can be really useful as well, Alice, that that I picked up in an unlikely space from um, by Neil Malarkey, the kind of who's part of this, the um, Austin Powers combo, like the, you know the um, Austin Powers type improv piece. But anyway, but there's an amazing world from improv drama skills from improv drama applied to sustainability and climate. So in improv, yeah. whatever ha- whatever gets given to you, you have to treat as a gift. Because that's the only way the improv works. Whatever happens, whatever physical thing happens or word is given to you, you can't go, I don't like that one. Give me another one kind of stuff. And Mm -hmm. the lesson for that, I think, for us trying to make change happen is that when people say to us about your repair cafe, Mm. uh, oh, it's going to be really difficult, is take that statement as a gift and go, yeah, you're right. It's going to be really hard. What what first step would you make? Mm. And it, and it, it stops people attacking gets them alongside you and then from there you can have a really positive discussion mm. i think as environmentalists and people who care it's really easy to go no it's not difficult or it's really important rather than acknowledge its difficulty but get them in step alongside us so i put i put a link in the chat but it's an amazing network some great resources brilliant thank you we, we've had that a lot saying you know telling people our kind of big plan for the science center a lot of people saying oh that's a bit ambitious and um and yes it is <laughs> but i think we need to Think of ambitious projects at the moment, and because you know, we we there is a desperate need for people to have a better understanding of the crisis that we're in. So, yeah. I mean, like at the start of your talk, Andy mentioned bold. I mean, for me, it's uh, some of my family members might um, get annoyed sometimes because I, I I sort of say, or even my team, I don't know, <laughs> I might say, you know, if it's easy, it's not worth doing. And we need to see that as a gift, the fact that it is difficult because that's where we can learn. And that challenge is a challenge to rise to. Um, So, yeah, totally agree. Um, We've got a question come in around leadership, which which I love. Um, It's from Tom, Tom Deacon, such a good friend of mine. Hi, Tom, (laughs) Um, which is around business leadership and behavior change in times in the in the challenging times we are in in the times of emergency um which is as leaders in in smes um what personal ethic that manifests in in that leader in that leader's behavior in the workplace would have the deepest impact on taking staff with them on the climate challenge journey does anyone want to respond to that from our perspective, since we're very new to this and we're, you know, running a business or an organisation is, is quite an alien concept to us. But but we, we've, we've thought very hard about, you know, how we'd like a business to run. And I suppose for this, we feel like if you're if you have some employees and people that you're working with, being transparent with them, you know, not just kind of making all the big decisions behind closed doors, being hugely open about it and and getting them on board. Because, of course, we want we have a vision of, of um, you know, how we want our organisation to be. And, you know, if you're doing an ethical or environmentally ethical uh, business or organisation, then you'll hopefully have the people who also buy into that working with you and for you. But making the decisions and, and just everything you do, whether it's salaries or how you employ people, making it completely transparent and fair and really 
and and open to change as well if it's not working change it you know and, and just I don't know but for, we, we kind of really want to just take the very best aspects of the best companies and the ones that we've seen or heard about or learned about that seem to be the ones that don't hide things from from their employees I think as a as a leader you need to be open and transparent yeah I'll, uh, Andy did you want to jump in there? yeah well, I, I guess the same for me about um it's there's something there's, there's a kind of a combination I think of kind of walking the talk and, and consistency and in everything that we do because I think if you're not if you're talking about stuff that you don't do it's pretty hard to, it's pretty hard to expect people to change and and I guess it's there's a, there's loads of quotes around you know Peter Euston off whoever you know communication is the art of what's understood not what's said and I think you know it's, it's like what, as soon as we think we've told something you know shared something enough times with the staff team about what we're trying to do say it two or three times more not times more but like multiply that number many many times because this is surprisingly hard to get your head around at a heart level and I think so really repeating the message far more times than you think it's going to be necessary in different ways in a different context so that everyone like everyone in a business can understand the relationship between their job and my grandson's grandchildren's shoes yeah yeah, cheers, Andy. What, what about you, Phil? I think as a follow-on to, to both all the guys, really, it's, about, it's, it's that sort of integrity. I mean, is it sort of something like 90% of communication is non-verbal? Um, it's the fact that people know whether you, I, I mean, perhaps you could train it, but you are who you are. Your reactions will are because of who you are and it's, it's what you believe at your core, really. And the people that you surround yourselves if they share those, um, they they will resonate. Um, the people that don't will um, will understand to a certain point, but some of them will move on. But I think the main thing, I mean, they say integrity is 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 what you do when no one's looking, really. And it's the fact that uh, they like to get you what they don't, really. Um, and it's it's your vision, it's your your shared goal, and and you'll get followers. If, if, if people resonate with you, really. Yeah, and we can all be role models, can't we? I think le leaders, yeah, whether you think of yourself as a leader or not, I think we're all leaders. And I, I, The other thing is I always say that a leader, just because a leader isn't someone in a position of seniority, um, because there's there's people that uh that have been under me the the next to me that the, and and uh, i think you can you can learn from them and it's having that ability to learn from people and also say i mean i, I do it I, I mess up all the time <laughs> and it's learning from your mistakes and saying look i did that i messed it up i won't do it again and it's that so it's, it's it comes back to transparency again what natalie was saying is and humility it's, yeah and learning yeah being open to that isn't it learning by doing um yeah that's really great i mean one of the things i just wanted to share quickly was um <laughs> i've probably mentioned it a few times to my colleagues but it's a, a book i'm reading at the moment called all we can save and it's around exploring that different type of leadership which is rooted in they talk about it being rooted in um compassion creativity collaboration and curiosity um and for me that's just a wonderful framing um for just life but also um leadership and particularly the way we the way we sort of think and do um there's, so there's a piece here chris that i'd love i kind of maybe kick off an idea and then hand over to alice and natalie so ella's kitchen the um you know baby baby food company showed that 67 percent of business leaders who've got kids change their sustainability policy at work as a consequence of conversations at home around the dinner table, 67%. And the most effective changes of opinion of conservative dad's views on climate are 15 year old girls. And so, so then there's a huge opportunity when you've got one county council for Devon to say, could you set out to get every single child in Devon carbon literate by the end of primary school 
and then shrink wrap the schools with the digital, with the right kind of digital layer so that they can understand the carbon impact of travel, food, clothing, waste, energy, et cetera, and start solving from, a, from primary real world challenges every day as their curriculum. It's just that, that becomes the numbers they do, that becomes the questions they ask, the influence they try to do. Because I guess for me, part of that is that if we can turn learners into leaders, then, then together, it's, no, there are no county councillors who can say no that many times to really, really convincing 14 year olds. Great, yeah, I mean, let's do it. The time is now. Um, yeah, and Natalie, did you have any thoughts on that or, or Alice? I think that sounds amazing. And yeah, I certainly, I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated by looking at my, looking at my daughter, she's four and um, she already, she asked for a litter picker for her birthday. And she, she, like, she already, I don't feel like I've instilled this in her, but well, I think there's just a different, there is a growing different environment. Just it's just a coincidence, Alice. But it's, it's lovely. Yeah. And it's, it's, and we go to the beach and she's like, that's disgusting. Look at that. And she's like, there, collect all the bits. And it's just, I think it's really funny, but it's lovely. And I think, gosh, you know, they, if we were bringing up a whole generation like that, then that's just, that is very exciting the potential in those children as you say if you can actually embed that into curriculum because the thing is you know we have to accept that not every family will care about it and therefore not every child will have it instilled in them from home but if it could be embedded into curriculum that would be incredible because then every child is exposed to that and yeah really I think over time that would be culturally reinforced as well so it becomes it becomes the norm not to drop litter I mean I, I I'm sure everyone in this call is already the norm not to drop this, mm. but some people it just doesn't even process. Yeah. Uh, and that's what I was talking about with with um, with the uh, the nutrients because we're currently working on some packaging that if ever if it was law, this again comes back to um, the question earlier. If if, if it was policy and, and all packaging had to be biosphere based, then yeah, litter. Because you're compo you're you're composting, you're you're feeding the plants, you're you're like you you crack on, you feed the fish. Um and then eventually the two will catch up in the bottom of the triangle and the top is exciting. Yeah, I guess we also have to be careful there, don't we, around the behaviours that instills. Um I don't want to go into an in-depth discussion on like biodegradable plastics, but it's that responsibility and the single use nature of it, there has to be some, there has to be a balance of, for me, I'd rather not have single use stuff at all. Um, and biodegradable shouldn't be an option because we're reusing everything um, or not using it in the first place. <laughs> um, so there has to be that balance as well, but the things that we, yeah. So th there's a great point and um, really interesting to explore. Um, I'm just looking if any we've got just 10 minutes left to sort of wrap up the discussion um if anyone's got any other questions do put them in the chat there was a question in there phil around um where your products are made and the production of them um i'm just skipping back to that one apologies so that is from robert um Rob Alexander, which is around, yeah, where are they made? Is it is it China? And are there plans to bring production to the UK? Um, yeah, huge, huge question, but go for it. Yeah, we 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 um we we produce all our um yeah most of our products in China. Um, we get some base materials from Japan and uh, Korea, but we um. We, we mainly produce our China. I have looked into um, trying to get it over to the UK. Um, it's still something that's on my radar. Um, I did, a, I was quite close a few years ago about um, one of our products, but the um, the costs for a light for light product were, were astronomical. Um, unfortunately, it would just mean it would be unfeasible. It, it would just wouldn't be practical. Um, I think um, the numbers were, I think it was four, four thousand, four thousand dollars in in China and twenty two thousand pounds in the UK, and it, it, it just couldn't, it couldn't work. I, I, I don't get me wrong, it, it's definitely something that 
I'm super keen on doing. And as soon as I can, I will. <laughs> um, but I think for now, it's, it's just something that we, we couldn't do at the minute. So there's, I'm not sure if he's still on the core, Chris, but there's a, there's a, I've been talking to this lovely guy, Simon Terry, who, who runs Angle Poise Lights. And they're starting to put multi-generational guarantees on their products. So, so your children's children will be able to guarantee to be able to get the spare parts to fix the product. And maybe Phil, it's something that to look at, you know, providing boards haven't been punctured to say, actually, is there any reason why one of your products that hasn't been stored in the sunshine couldn't last for a hundred years? Even if the boards have it, yeah, exactly. Yeah, com completely. You, you don't, again, it comes back to the ownership thing. You sort of, you're just holding it onto it. I mean, I kind of think a couple of watch brands have said that, haven't they? It's like heirlooms. You don't own this. You're just, you're just taking care of it for a bit. Patek uh, Philippe, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Com completely yeah completely yeah i think um yeah definitely that that notion of stu yeah stewardship and yeah what we've been discussing around sh sh yeah sharing um i mean there's a great there's a so on that notion of there's some great stuff happening around future generations so if you don't know of it the in wales the well-being of future generations act um and there's a similar one the environment bill trying to be pushed through in the uk around taking into account future generations in our decision making um, and Wales is a le leader on that um, this is also a really interesting book I think Andy might might know the author which is called how to think long term in a short term world um, which is which is based on that idea of sort of long term thinking and, and, and seven generation thinking so that's a really interesting resource um, if people want to check that out, that's called How to Think Long Term in a Short Term World. Um, have you got anything to add on that, Andy? Well, I, yeah, I th well, I think the long, the long term bit that really struck me was the work done by um, by uh, uh, Roman Kanzanik, which is this lovely book here about um, the Good Ancestor. That's the one, yeah, the Good Ancestor. And 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 it's and what I love about his work is that. Um, he just, one of the things he describes is in Japan, they have a process whereby people in the community take on, put on the robes of future, of future generations. And it's their job to represent their view at meetings. And not surprisingly, they always come up with more radical stories. So I think the idea is as local authorities, as health boards start to think strategically about the long-term well-being of counties, of course you should be thinking about your grandchildren's grandchildren. Because if you don't work backwards from the end, it's really hard to get the right start point. And 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 what and Roman's point is that we're just not good, we're not old enough as a species yet to have learnt the importance of doing that. Mm. Yes, yeah it's, yeah, it's so important. And um, the more we can talk, I think the more we can talk about it, the more that then we can bring it into our actions. Um, so yes, it's such an important point. Um, so and I'd just quickly like to delve into, if we can, for like two, two or three minutes, um, is uh, Natalie and Alice, you mentioned your sort of open source, your, your business plan or proposal on your website. One of the things that excited me when I looked at that was around, you mentioned um, the four day working week and around how you sort of have a, an ambition to, to go towards that. Um, and I just wanted to just check in and, and see sort of why that was and, and hear your thoughts on that. Do you want to go for it, Natalie? Or? Sure. I mean, we're, we're not quite there yet because there's <laughs> two of us and, of course, a, a, you know, a team of trustees and advisors, but, but we're doing a lot of work at the moment. And getting it up off the ground is, is really challenging. So we aspire to a four-day week, but um, not quite there yet. But, you know, hopefully once we're in a situation where we have, you know, um, funding and employees and kind of sustainable ongoing charitable business, um, yeah, we'd love to j just really make sure that that everyone who works with us and for us, uh, you know, it's, it's not it's not, oh, I've got to go to work, clock in, clock out kind of thing. You know, having a four day week would be great because then you get that balance between, uh, you know, uh, life and and work. But I'd, I'm, and also providing other opportunities as well. So, you know, lots of breaks and having uh, kind of, I don't know, yoga evenings or, or whatever or something. I don't know. We, at the moment, it's very kind of 
it's a blank canvas. We want to take the best you know, experience from other organizations as we can. And we recognize that sometimes, you know, people want to work more or less or, or whatever. It, it, flexible working is really, is really important for us. Um, we saw a really interesting article about a company that tried to be incredibly progressive by providing unlimited annual leave. And the problem was not that the, that people took the biscuit and took too much. Some people took none because there was no kind of required amount to take. And so they had to change it to a, to a very generous sort of required amount of, of annual leave because people sort of respected the company so much that, and, and a lot of them were sort of driven to that company because they were quite, they were passionate people who were kind of, I don't know, you, you want to make sure that you, I think with anything like this, where people are passionate about it, you're gonna end up with workaholics because, because people will find it so hard to switch off because it really matters and they're fired up. But actually, you probably do need to enforce. It's like, actually, guys, you do need to turn off. Otherwise, you'll burn out. And so I think um, I think that attitude is really important to, to sort of to enforce a work life balance to an extent, because, yeah, certainly in this kind of realm, I think people will will probably just never stop working otherwise. And, and I, I guess, Alice, I think it's it's probably time to lose the balance of work life. Of the balance in the work and life as you say when you work you do something you really care about it's not a dip, it's not a balance it's true it's not yeah and i think yeah. this is just more about having a well-being balance yeah and so i think one of the things that we can do with them as employers is is maximize the number of times and certainly zoom hasn't made that any easier where you have walking meetings and meetings outdoors and meetings where you can hear bird song for real rather than as a as a lovely backdrop as john's got for instance and it's not quite the same as being outdoors when you're meeting people so i think maximizing the chance of people living well with good food you know good conditions and encouraging physical movement while working can all help to make improve the the, the well-being element of that work kind mm. of element yeah yeah that's a really good point. well on that note that's that's um let's bring it to a close and and i encourage you to get outside, um, go for a walk. It's beautiful. Hopefully it's going to be another beautiful sunset this evening. Um, and maybe just think about what's been said this evening and do get in touch with us. So I think all of the speakers would be happy to share their details, contact details yeah. and presentations. And we can email those out um, afterwards and we can explore what we've just started to discuss. We can explore that moving forward. Um, and we'd be really excited to do that. Um, and like the title of this event, the sort of action, well, climate action, the time is now. And for me, I just wanted to bring us to a close by saying one of my sort of favorite framings or quotes is around, there's no point talking about the future if it doesn't lead to action today. And let's have that balance of Beautiful conversation combined with practical local action. Um, so thank you for all coming. Um, it's been a great event. And yeah, thank you for coming, contributing your your questions and ideas. Uh, thank you to, to Andy, to Alice, to Natalie and to Phil. Really great, grateful for your time. <laughs> um, it's been super lovely. Just a quick note before we do, well, actually, I'd just love to hear a quick check out from each of you. Maybe just a three word check out. Just three, three words to, to bring us to a close. So Andy, do you wanna go first? My three words would be epic is possible. <laughs> Great, who wants to dive in next? Alice, do you wanna go for it? Oh, mine's like four. No, it's five. <laughs> five. Scientists just can't count. I'll let you have four. I'll let you have four. No, it's five. <laughs> <laughs> I'm rubbish at speaking concisely. <laughs> Basically, you can make a difference. <laughs> With cool. you in capital letters. Um, Phil? <laughs> I mean, that was pretty much what I was going to go with. I mean, uh, I think uh, uh, integrity, uh, I, think, I think playful, be encouraging them, yeah, and, and um, progressive. 
Integrity, Playful and Progressive. Awesome. Thanks, Phil. And Natalie? Alice stole mine a little bit. Oh. <laughs> I was going to talk about change can happen, but my, mine would be hope is powerful. Because we, we really feel that. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, we've just we've just gone a minute over, but that's that's great. Um, really keen to continue the discussion. Thanks again, and thank you all for coming on behalf of Low Carbon Devon and the Sustainable Earth Institute here at the University of Plymouth. We will be doing more of these events, as I mentioned at the start, and we will let you know the dates of those moving forward. Um, the next of which, which is a collaborative conference. Uh, which you're all invited to, which is in June. Um, it's called the Sustainable Earth Conference, um, organised by, it's a low carbon Devon event, but organised by the wider um, Sustainable Earth Institute, which is available to register now. Um, so do come along. It's a great event, as it says there, we've got a number of keynote speakers, guest speakers, workshops. I'll be doing a workshop on low carbon Devon and B Corp. There's loads of other things happening, so do put that in your diaries and do come along. But just to say um, thank you again from me. If you've got any feedback, if you've got any questions um, and want to get in touch with me, I'd really love to hear from you. Um, so get in touch via uh, my email address, christopher.woodfield at plymouth.ac.uk. I know it's a bit of a mouth mouthful. Nobody really calls me Christopher. <laughs> um, or get in touch with us through how you registered for the event. So I just want to leave you by saying have a beautiful evening. And thanks again to everyone for coming. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>